And welcome everyone to this talk about thirst in ME-CFS. Uh, I'm an ME patient myself. I have had ME for five years. And one of the worst symptoms I had um, up until a few years ago was extreme thirst. Uh, it's a sim symptom that I've managed to resolve. Uh, and I've actually written a book about what I think is causing thirst in ME. There seem to be uh, a lot, though not all, uh, ME patients who suffer from this symptom, but uh, it's not actually been mapped out why it's happening or how to treat it. Um, so, for example, if you look on ME-CFS forums, you will see hundreds of people talking about suffering from uh, excessive thirst. And there's also uh, people who work in the field, doctors and researchers who have noted that people have this symptom. Um, some of you may have come across a doctor called uh, Dr. Jacob Tettelbaum, and he has described uh, ME patients as drinking like fish and peeing like racehorses. Uh, another researcher noted that his patients, he saw them drinking up to 12 litres a day. So it seems to be a problem that does affect uh, people with our illness. Now, in terms of how frequent this symptom is, as I said, not everyone seems to have it. And there's not been a study in ME that actually sets out to see how common it is. But there have been a couple of studies in long COVID, uh, which have asked patients, uh, what are their worst symptoms, like thousands of patients asking them that question. And from two big research papers, um, it was found that around 35 to 40% of long COVID patients suffer from excessive thirst. So if we assume long COVID and ME are essentially the same thing, uh, this would seem to give us an indication of how common the symptom is. Symptom is. So my plan for the talk is I'm going to describe what the nature of this thirst is like. Um, I'm going to talk about my theory, my hypothesis for what I believe causes the thirst. Then I'm going to talk about uh, how I think it can be treated. And finally, I'll share my own personal experience with this symptom, because once upon a time I suffered from this at the most severe end, uh, because it does operate on a spectrum. Uh, and I actually wasn't far away from dying because of this symptom. So I will share my own personal story uh, with that. Now, even if you're listening to this and you don't suffer from thirst, um, there will still be uh, things about research into ME that I hope will be of interest to you. So what is this thirst like? What, what are its clinical features? From reading through hundreds of forum posts in ME uh, support groups, there are certain characteristics that are repeated uh, from, from patient to patient. This, this thirst, it's always unquenchable. So that means no matter how much someone drinks, it's, it never gets rid of the thirst. Uh, patients tend to produce a lot of dilute urine. So the urine is very clear. Patients have a tendency towards developing low blood sodium levels. Uh, the medical term for that is hyponatremia. It's when you don't have enough salt in your bloodstream. I'm not saying everyone has this, but there's a tendency towards developing it. And some people have mild um, drop in blood sodium and some people profound, which is very dangerous. The thirst ranges in severity. Uh, so some people, they're at the milder end and maybe they're just guzzling down three or four litres of water per day. But you will read accounts of people drinking seven, eight, ten litres per day, all the way up to 20 litres and possibly more in some very extreme cases. And the other uh, feature that you see repeated is that the thirst is always worse when people crash. So during post-exertional malaise, people get thirstier. So why is this happening? I'll jump straight to the, to the, to the chase and tell you what my big, the big hypothesis is that I'm trying to uh, map out. Uh, I believe that MECFS patients suffer from excessive thirst because they don't have enough blood. Um, now, in order for this idea to make sense, we need uh, three things. Number one, we need it to be possible for the, um, for the brain to produce a thirst signal when someone doesn't have enough blood. So not just to produce thirst when someone doesn't have enough water. Number two, we need it to be the case that ME patients don't have enough blood 
for some reason to do with their illness. They routinely just don't have the same amount of blood as a healthy person. And finally, when we put those two things together, we would want to see the same clinical features that I just mentioned of this kind of particular kind of thirst. Okay, so to get into the first thing we need, it is indeed the case that the brain actually has uh, two thirst centers. One is for when you don't have enough water. And the medical name for that is the first thing on the slide here, the osmotic thirst center. Um, that's the kind of thirst that most healthy people will, will only ever experience in their lives. But the brain has a second thirst center, uh, which is called in the medical term, the hypovolemic thirst center. And hypovolemic is this sort of scientific way of saying not having enough blood or low blood volume. So this is the thirst center that gets triggered when the blood levels drop. The hypovolemic thirst center was discovered in 1968. And to simplify things, um, it's basically triggered when the blood volume drops by 10%. So a healthy human being has around five liters of blood. So once that's getting down to about 4.7 liters, this thirst center will kick into action and create a thirst signal. So indeed, we have the first requirement, but just to point out one thing to you, um, after osmotic thirst center, you'll see in brackets water appetite. And after hypovolemic thirst center, you'll see in brackets salt plus water appetite. These two thirst centers are looking for different things. This is very important. When you don't have enough water in your body, you just need to drink more water. That's water appetite. But if you don't have enough blood, you see blood is salty stuff. And it doesn't work if you're short on blood just to drink water. Because uh, in order to actually expand the blood volume to hold on to the fluid that you're drinking, what you're drinking needs to have some sort of salty element to it. OK, so we have the first thing. The brain produces a thirst signal when you don't have enough blood. The second thing we need, ME patients and how much blood do they have and actually having less blood. So this particular aspect I'm going to focus on in more detail, um, because even if we just don't consider its relevance to thirst, uh, it's really important for understanding ME and why uh, we often have the kinds of symptoms that we do. So some of you may not have known this, other, for other people, it may be something you, you're well aware of already, but ME patients routinely do not have enough blood. Uh, hypovolemia, the medical term for not having enough blood, is a central characteristic of our illness and it operates on a spectrum. Uh, so some people have only a small drop in blood and other people have a more profound drop in blood. And this is a really important point because two research papers have both shown that the more severely affected you are with ME, the less blood you have as a rule of thumb. So if someone is housebound or bedridden, it's highly likely that they have far less blood than someone who is still capable of going for a half an hour walk, for example. So how much less blood are we talking about? There was a great study in 2018 that looked at this question. That's on the, on the slide here. It's by the Dutch husband and wife research team, Visser, Visser and Van Kampen, and their paper was called Blood Volume Status in Patients with Chronic Fatigue Syndrome Relation to Complaints. And what they were looking at in that paper is they actually took uh, ME patients and they were able to measure how much blood they had. They divided those ME patients into two groups with and without orthostatic intolerance. Orthostatic intolerance means difficulty standing up, getting dizzy, very heavy legs, pots, that kind of thing. What they found was that both groups had a reduction in blood, but the reduction in blood amongst those with orthostatic intolerance was more profound. And those were the patients also who were housebound, so they were more severely affected. What they found was that the, these patients with orthostatic intolerance had a mean total blood volume reduction of 23% in comparison to the physiological norm. That means if a healthy person has five liters of blood, 
these patients only had 3.85 liters of blood. So they had a 1.15 blood volume liter, uh, 1.15 liter blood volume drop. This is obviously uh, physiologically catastrophic and uh, would cause someone to feel very unwell. Uh, just to put it into context, if someone, a healthy person, were to lose uh, that much blood uh, just because they're in an accident or something like that, all at once, it's straight off to hospital because it's a medical emergency. But in ME, the situation develops over such a long period of time that in a strange kind of way, the body adapts to it, even though you still feel horrendous. In terms of the patients in the non-orthostatic intolerance group, the blood volume drop was more like four or 500 milliliters. Okay, so it's important to think about, irrespective of thirst, why is this important? Low blood volume causes a significant amount of ME symptoms uh, or contributes to them. Uh, for example, uh, people often talk about the uh, flight or fight nervous system activation that is common in people with our illness. Um, low blood volume contributes to that because when the brain doesn't have enough blood, it freaks out and it will create a stress response. Low blood volume also contributes to cognitive dysfunction, brain fog, brain isn't getting enough blood to work. It contributes directly to the exercise dysfunction. Obviously, it's one of many reasons. Um, but uh, the, the most uh, obvious reason for this is that the heart doesn't have enough blood to work with. So it kind of, the cardiovascular system is under a lot of strain. As I say here, tons of other things besides, because what this means is that it creates a state of global hypoperfusion. That means global, like all throughout the body, hypoperfusion, there's not enough blood perfusing into the organs, into the muscles. Quality of life can improve significantly if you take measures to treat low blood volume. Okay, now you're probably wondering, why is this happening? Why would someone end up not having enough blood? And uh, the research has been working on this question for some time. Um, it really speaks to a um, what's been found is something unique to ME-CFS. Uh, it's not, this is not something your doctor will know about, what I'm about to tell you now. They will say this isn't possible, but it is something that has been shown to be the case in ME. So uh, in everyone's body, there is a, a hormonal system, a kind of a, a, a network of hormones that work together. Um, it's called the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. Um, all of these things are hormones, renin, angiotensin, and aldosterone. So they all have, they're all chemical messengers that have a job in the body. And in this case, this hormonal system has the primary job of holding onto salt. Now, um, in a healthy person, this system works amazingly. Let's say you are living in uh, the bush in Africa 20,000 years ago, and uh, there's no salt mines anywhere, and you're, you haven't been able to uh, kill an animal and drink its blood anytime recently, so you haven't had any salt. This hormonal system will kick into action to hold on to the salt that you do have to, to keep you alive. But this isn't working. This system isn't working in ME. Um, the way it's described in the research is that this uh, hormonal system is blunted, downregulated, and suppressed. And so what this means is that the ME patient is always losing more salt uh, from their body than a healthy person. When someone with ME goes to the toilet, they're peeing out more salt than a healthy person would all the time. And the really striking thing about this is that even though our blood volume goes down, it goes low, this hormonal system doesn't rev up. It doesn't kick into action to increase the blood volume. In a healthy person, that would happen. And that is what all doctors are taught will happen. But it doesn't happen for us. And the final point to make about this is that this suppression of these salt retention hormones gets worse when you crash. So in post-exertional malaise, you lose even more salt 
than uh, when you are in a stable period. Okay, so we've examined uh, low blood volume in ME, but how can we uh, how can we bring this back to thirst? So this is my basic theory for what's happening uh, when we connect the, the, the dots of the last two things. So the ME patient experiences a drop in blood volume of at least 300 milliliters. This leads to the triggering of the thirst center for low blood volume. In this case, the body is wanting you to drink something salty because blood is salty, but the patient doesn't do that because the patient isn't thinking, oh, there's the triggering of my second, my brain's second thirst center. It wants me to drink something salty because I don't have enough blood because no one thinks that way. When you're thirsty, you just drink water. That's normal. But in this case, it's a mistake because water cannot boost blood volume. If you drink a liter of water, um, the kidneys will just excrete it all out about by about an hour later. That's just what it does with water. So the blood volume will just remain low. So I think patients get into this vicious cycle because they're applying the wrong solution to their problem. They're short on blood, they drink water, it just goes in and out, and they're not increasing their blood volume. And so the thirst remains. And I believe that this vicious cycle, because they're applying, understandably applying the wrong solution to the, to the issue, can explain the typical symptoms I described at the beginning. The thirst is unquenchable because they're doing the wrong thing. It's not about water. Uh, the urine is dilute because they're drinking so much water. And the low blood sodium, the hyponatremia, can develop for two reasons. Both because if you drink a lot of water, it pulls salt out of your blood. And because of the uh, suppression of the salt retention hormones, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, that's also pulling salt out of the blood. So for two reasons. So in a nutshell, I think this is what can explain thirst in our illness. Um, I'm not saying it's the only reason. I think there could be more reasons. Um, there could be inflammatory responses. There could be issues to do with histamine. There could be issues to do with mast cell activation issues. There could be problems to do with neurological dysregulation. But I do believe from my best effort at, at, at reading many people's accounts of this symptom, of my own story of uh, doing a lot of research, that this is the biggest reason why people will end up with severe thirst and that addressing this should address most of the problem. Okay. So moving on to the next part of the talk, how can this actually be treated? Um, now, I'm sure people will ask in the, in the Q&A, can't I just add a lot of salt to my meals? Um, and I don't necessarily think that's the best answer, but we can talk about that. I'm just going to cut straight to what I think is the best way of dealing with it. So you'll all have heard of diorolite, I'm sure. And I'm sure many of you will have taken diorolite at different times. Um, these little sachets of salt, potassium, and glucose. Uh, people usually have them after they have uh, suffered from vomiting or after they suffered from diarrhea or something like that. They lose a lot of fluid internally and they go and get these little sachets, they mix them with some water, and it helps to replace the fluid and electrolytes that you've lost. I'm sure everyone here has probably taken that at some point in their life. But the great thing is about these sachets, they are highly effective at increasing blood volume. Um, so they're not just for when you're having diarrhea or vomiting, they're perfect for people with ME, they're perfect for people with POTS. And the reason they're able to do this is because they're created with this sort of magical proportion, this right proportion of a balance between salt and glucose. And when you drink this solution, there's this sort of really clever thing the body is able to do when salt is in the presence of the right amount of glucose. It's able to pull the salty solution across from your guts and directly into the bloodstream. So when you drink a sachet of diorolite, all of the salty solution that you're drinking will end up in your bloodstream, increasing blood volume very neatly. 
there's not really anything else that, that that's easily accessible that you can that that, that can do this uh, for you. So it's very neat at what it does. Now, when you drink something like Dorolite, uh, the effect is temporary. You're drinking the salty solution. It goes in, goes into your bloodstream, and then over a process of several hours, uh, my best understanding is that the kidneys will then work to excrete that solution. But you can simply repeat the effect by drinking more uh, diorolite, also known as oral rehydration solution. That's the sort of generic name uh, throughout the day. Now, how much? By how much does uh, drinking uh, oral, rehydra oral rehydration solution increase your blood volume? Now, this is just my best guess. Okay, it's it's. I'm going to give you some science in a moment, but this is my best guess because no one's actually specifically set out to answer this question, uh, to my knowledge. But uh, how I've worked it out is this: one liter of blood has nine grams of salt. If you drink one liter of oral rehydration solution. There are 4.3 grams of salt in that. So that's about half of what's in a liter of blood. So my best guess is if you drink one liter of oral rehydration solution, you will expand your blood volume by around half a liter of blood temporarily. Now, there was a study that looked at drinking oral rehydration solution in POTS patients. So maybe people here with POTS. Um, as we know, POTS and ME often overlap. They're highly related. Both illnesses, very common to suffer from low blood volume, seemingly because of very similar reasons. So this study from 2019 uh, was looking at um, the effect of giving POTS patients a whole liter of oral rehydration solution, like diorolite equivalent. And what they did was, is they actually measured how much um, how much after they drunk this liter, how much they had improved their blood flows throughout their body and to their brain. So this was their I'm sorry, and they were comparing the effect of drinking this liter with also giving a liter of saline IV through the uh, uh, through the vein. So this was their conclusion conclusion. Giving oral rehydration solution to POTS patients, produced effective short term of course i can't actually i've got the i can't read that because i've got this um the other image the images of people are coming over the text i hopefully you can i'll read it and then hopefully you can also read it as i go along i won't be able to read the the the, the other part giving ors to pots patients produced effective short term mitigation of orthostatic intolerance presumably by facilitating rapid repletion of i think it says salt and water Within the short time course of this investigation, ORS was at least as effective in decreasing orthostatic intolerance as saline IV. This supports the use of ORS as an easy, easy, safe, practical therapy to mitigate the symptoms associated with chronic orthostatic intolerance. Because ORS is inexpensive, safe, and easily administered, it may be considered as an effective alternative for the rapid resolution of symptoms associated with orthostatic intolerance. So this was a really exciting study because it's showing something as a cheap and safe that can really improve someone's problems with blood volume. Now, in terms of what I've done uh, that helped me the most with, uh, with my problems with thirst and generally quality of life, um, at a certain point about a year ago, I basically stopped drinking water, uh, pure water. Now, I'm not saying entirely, like I'd still drink a cup of tea or maybe mix some supplements in some water. But in general, the vast majority of the fluids that I drink now are oral rehydration solution. And this has made a profound difference to my quality of life. Of all the things that I have ever tried, it's been the most helpful. Uh, I believe that uh, it's probably important not like to actually replace normal water consumption with just drinking oral rehydration solution because the pure water will, will counteract to a degree the effect of the oral rehydration solution. Um, this is because uh, water, as I said earlier, it pulls out salt. So if you drink a liter of diorolite and all the salt that's in that, um, and then you drink a liter of water, the second liter will risk just pulling out the electrolytes you've consumed in the diorolite. 
So for me, the greatest change actually came when I just went to only drinking or a rehydration solution. Um, now, this has made a major difference to my quality of life. So just to report my own personal experience with this, um, not only has it helped my thirst, but uh, I have felt like the thing about it is like you, you literally feel your blood volume expanding inside of you. You feel blood getting back into your skin. You feel it getting into your brain. Um, you feel uh, your nervous system calming down because the brain has more blood to work with. Your legs are lighter. Um, your heart has an easier time. I'm not saying it's like magic bullet, but I'm just saying for what it's doing, you can really feel all of these things improving. Um, I would describe it to, uh, at times, it's like the lights switch back on. Uh, there have been times where I've been in a crash, kind of, you know, on, on the sofa, kind of stapled, and I'll drink a litre of oral rehydration solution. And by the time I finish drinking that, I can get up and go and do something. So it, it really does have, uh, it can have a, a powerful effect on quality of life when you take measures to get your blood volume back to, to something more normal. Now, the product that I use specifically, I'm not in any way affiliated with Normalite, I'm just giving this recommendation, um, is, is this product, uh, Normalite, um, which um, is, has been specifically designed for ME, POTS and dysautonomia patients. So it's very friendly for, for uh, people like us who can have lots of sensitivities. It doesn't include uh, preservatives and sort of odd things. Um, some, in Dioralite, there can be some strange things. Um, there are different versions of Dioralite. There's a Dioralite natural version, which has the least rubbish in it. Um, but this one is very good for, for people with our kinds of illness. Unfortunately, it's only at the moment available from the US, which means there's uh, customs fees. But they hope to have it available throughout the EU via Amazon soon. So if you are interested in ordering this particular product, um, you can go to their website, sign up to their mailing list, and uh, it will be announced when, when they are uh, shipping in Europe. OK, so now to come to my own personal story. Um, <clears throat> so you know, I first became ill in 2018, and back then I was certainly thirstier than normal, but it was more manageable. Maybe I was drinking around four litres of water per day. But about three years ago, that suddenly changed, and I actually descended for a six-month period into what I could only describe as hell. Uh, it was very severe. Um, so on my good days, I was drinking eight to ten litres, but when I crashed, uh, I drank up to 20 litres in a 24-hour period. So I was at the most extreme end of this symptom. And this time was very severe. I'm still traumatised by the symptoms I experienced then. And I'm not being at all hyperbolic when I say that I actually thought I was often dying at that time. Um, I, there were times, I mean, one of the cruelest things about, about the thirst and um, uh, is that it would be worse at night. So I couldn't sleep. And I mean that, you know, literally I couldn't sleep at all. There was one period where for four nights I only slept on one of them. And, you know, that was really, really horrendous. Um, so I really fought through. I mean, they were, these were times not, not to, you know, not to put too fine a point, but I really felt like I was fighting for the morning light at various times uh, during, during that period. Um, but I didn't know what was happening. You know, I had no idea. Um, I had read some papers in the area of it, but no one had mapped out what was going on. I knew that other people suffered from this symptom. I knew that there were some people who were as severely affected as I was, even though they were a minority, but I couldn't find any answers. So it was it was not just hell, but it was like a hell that I couldn't see a way out of. Uh, eventually, I went to hospital. That was at the end of January 2021. Um, I said, I'm not going to get into hospital now. It could be curtains for me. So I said, I'll just I'll take a risk. I'll go in. And uh, what they found was that I had a blood sodium level, which was very low. So with 116, the normal range is 135 to 143. Um, so this is a, so low that I could have been in a coma. And um, basically, when you have, when your blood sodium level goes too low, um, you're, um, you, you get excessive water in your bloodstream and it can go into your brain and, and swell your brain. And then you can go into a coma and die. So I was, you know, in a really dangerous situation. 
I was treated uh, as if I was an intensive care patient uh, for a week, even though I was in a standard ward. Um, they didn't have space in ICU, but I know from my medical records that that's how they were treating me. Um, they gave me blood tests. They took blood tests two hours, every two hours, morning and night. So it was a very, very difficult week. So this was very, you know, very challenging. Um, I tried to explain to the medical team in the hospital that it's not uncommon for ME patients to be thirsty. Um, I tried to explain to them that, um, I, I, I said, I mentioned papers to them, which kind of pointed towards something going on. But anyway, at the end of the week, they diagnosed me with having a mental health condition, uh, which they called psychogenic, which is called psychogenic polydipsia. So the idea here is that uh, people are drinking a huge amount of fluid, not because they need to for any physiological reason, but just because they're mentally ill. So for some reason, they have very mentally ill people, so the thinking goes, have this uh, strange urge to spend all day long drinking a lot of water. So this is what they diagnosed me with. Um, it was very humiliating. Uh, I uh, you know, was treated as if I was crazy a lot of the time. They, they used extremely simple language. There was, it was like they were talking to me as if I was three years old. And they would say things like, um, you know, if you're like, can we trust you not to drink, you know, out of the toilet or out of the, uh, you know, wash basin in the toilet? If, if you go there, do we have to go with you? Like that was how they treated me. Um, and at one point I was standing in the, in the corridor and I overheard the doctor and the nurse talking about me. And uh, they said, oh, Patrick, he's been diagnosed with psychogenic polydipsia. And they laughed. So I was treated, you know, in a way that was quite humiliating. Um, uh, but in the end, look, I was very glad to get out of hospital. And I am grateful for the fact that they normalized my blood sodium level. I was aware, even before going in, that ME patients usually ended up with this diagnosis. I'd come across other people uh, who, who had suffered this. So I had feared it when I was going in. Anyway, it's what happened. I got out of hospital and for two weeks, things were relatively stable. But as soon as I next crashed, the thirst came roaring back. And I remember thinking, oh God, you know, how am I going to deal with this? I, I can't go down the same old route. I started drinking more water, it didn't work. I was like, I have to work out what's actually happening here. Um, I've got to work out why it is that ME patients suffer from such thirst. So I was reading a book about low blood sodium and I actually, there was a diagram in that book, which was um, a talking about thirst physiology. And on that diagram, it said the brain has two thirst centers, one for water and one for blood. And I remember thinking, is that it? Is that the reason? Is that why I've been so thirsty? You know, have I just been thirsty because of my illness? And I've just been applying the wrong solution to it. So I immediately went out and bought a box of Diorolite, came back, drank 600 milliliters of it, and the thirst went way down. The light switched back on. I could feel blood getting back into my, into my muscles. I was able to just immediately go and walk up a staircase without stopping, which I couldn't do before that. And then I realized this is actually what it was. This is what I've been suffering from, thirst caused by low blood volume, not some strange mental compulsion just to drink water. So I was delighted to work out the way out of this nightmare. I've never suffered from that particular nightmare ever since. Um, and about a year and a half after I got out of hospital, I decided that I was actually going to look into this condition, so-called uh, psychogenic polydipsia. I was going to see what is it about? You know, is it really uh, based on something well established? Is it actually based on a lot of research? Like what's going on here? Why, why, why does this diagnosis exist? So I went and, and read at least the abstract, but also in full, in full, nearly every paper that's ever been written on this. There's not much, it's about a few hundred. And um, no one really cares about it. It doesn't get much research. And what I found was, it was actually developed in the 1940s and 50s by psychiatrists who were observing people with this, you know, drinking all this water. And they couldn't think what was causing it physiologically. So they just said it had to be mental illness. And if you read those papers, they literally actually say this is being caused by troubled childhoods, 
It's being caused by being hysterical females. It's being caused by uh, not having enough sex. It's being caused by being gay. There was a whole paper on that. Um, it's being caused by conversion disorders and delusional hypochondriasis. So that was the science, right? <laughs> that's 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 what that's what that's what their reasoning was. And ever since then, no one's ever challenged it. it, it it's it the way it is. It's viewed now. This condition is exactly the same as it was thought about in 1959. Nothing's changed, basically. Tiny little things, but nothing much. Uh, it's it's uh, received hardly any research. And uh, it's basically regarded as a medical mystery, even though at the same time, people will say, oh, it must be because they're crazy. Key point, the whole condition was conceptualized prior to the discovery of the Thirst Center for Low Blood Volume in 1968. I believe that if they had known about that at the beginning, things could have been very different. Here's the other big thing. When I went back to read those papers from the 30s, 40s, and 50s, they had case studies of patients. And when you took away all the Freudian you know, psych, uh, psychiatric slant on those patients, it's quite clear that they actually were ME patients. Um, they were described, uh, like, because they give the, the health history of these patients, and they would say things like, this patient developed health problems after a viral illness. This patient developed health problems after, um, uh, you know, having some kind of severe medical episode. Um, and they described things that could only be post-exertional malaise. This patient says that they ache all the time. This patient says they have breathlessness when they try to exert themselves. Um, and uh, one of the patients was described as having hysterical weakness of the legs. So basically, I came, when I started reading all these papers, I started to think this is, this what they call psychogenic polydipsia is just what has always been the thirst that ME patients experience and that no one's ever investigated. It's, it's always been a misreading and just saying it's, oh, it's mental illness. When actually it's because they are suffering, people are suffering from thirst caused by catastrophically not having enough blood due to their illness. So to prove my case, I've written a book about this and uh, it's called The Myth of Primary Polydipsia, Why Hypovolemic Dehydration Can Explain the Real Physiological Basis of so-called psychogenic water drinking. So in this book, which is available for free download from the myth of primary polydipsia.com, um, I go through the history of this idea of psychogenic water drinking. I, I expose all its Freudian ideas. I then have you know, a chapter describing thirst, you know, the low blood volume in ME, long COVID, POTS, how these patients are all very thirsty. I have a whole chapter on evidence from forums, you know, many, many posts where people are talking about this symptom. I talk about how to treat it. And look, I'm going to try to, to get this, to see if I can find someone who might be interested in taking on these ideas, who might be interested in, in studying them. Maybe it won't happen because I'm outside of the medical system. Um, but it's certainly something I intend to uh, try and, and work towards changing if I can. At the moment, people are being stigmatized when they're suffering from very severe symptoms. I actually came across uh, the case of an ME patient who was severe who died tragically, and uh, their cause of death was attributed to drinking too much water because of mental illness. And their carer actually wrote saying that they knew this was not the case and that the, the, the person they were looking after had died because um, of their illness. So this is something that really needs to change. And the final thing I'll say is, um, at the moment, all medical students are taught about this psychogenic polydipsia. If it can be shown that actually it's always been a mistake and it's been low blood volume that's causing the thirst in ME, people will have to learn about uh, low blood volume in ME and no one can learn about that and not realize that it's a very serious illness.